the divisive online safety bill will be back in Parliament next Monday. It's been bubbling along for a while, hasn't it, with making uh, amendments to it. Miriam Cates, the Conservative MP for Peniston and Stocksbridge, brought up the issues of the harms of online pornography to children in the House of Commons earlier this month. I had a chat with Miriam uh, before the show to get her thoughts on the importance of the bill to protect children. Miriam, you made a very impassioned speech in the House of Commons about the online safety harms bill. Why do you feel so strongly about it? Well, I think we rightly pay, are paying increasing attention to um, you know, the dangers that children perhaps face online and with smartphones. Every child has a smartphone now and there have been some high profile tragic cases like the case of Molly Russell that have, have started to, to raise public awareness of this. But actually, we're only scratching the surface when we're talking about you know, serious issues like self-harm and online bullying. Actually, underneath all this is this incredible um, epidemic of online pornography. Um, and just to, to kind of put it in perspective, in 2020, uh, porn sites received more views than Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, Zoom put together. And I think in, in, in uh, 2019, Pornhub had 42 billion separate views. This is an absolute epidemic. And about half of 11-year-olds, think have seen porn. Uh, and so, you know, once you get older than that, of course, it's most children. And I think the other thing to say is, as well as it being prolific, the kind of pornography that, that children are seeing, it's not what we might have seen in, you know, when we were growing up in a dodgy magazine or something like this. This is hardcore, abusive, violent, um, really horrendous, disgusting stuff that, you know, most adults would be absolutely outraged to think that children have free and easy access to this. And it is free and easy. It's almost entirely unregulated at the moment. And that's why we need the online safety bill. So what protections are there at the moment online? Almost none. I mean, so there are there's pornography that's provided by dedicated porn sites, you know, that make money out of porn. And in theory, children shouldn't be able to, to view those, but we all know that they can. But also there's a lot of user to user generated pornography that's either created, sadly, by children or um, or shared by children, often against their will and their better judgment through, you know, platforms that we all use all the time, WhatsApp and Discord and TikTok. Um, and it's just available to view and to be seen by children. And, you know, people who say, oh, well, it's parents' job to protect their children, they're not living in the real world is entirely unregulated. Um, and even if your child has no phone, no computer, no internet access, it takes nothing for the child sat, sat next to them in the classroom to just show them any old image. There are lots of concerns, aren't there, that the online safety bill will go too far and compromise people's freedoms. Is that the case? Well, I think it's about seeing children as children. We don't let them buy alcohol. We don't let them buy cigarettes. You know, we say to adults, you know, you are free to do what is legal uh, up to a point. You know, there are limits on, on all freedoms and there should be. But these are children. And I think it's really hard to, to understand that the depths of harms that are being caused here, because, you know, children are impressionable. Of course they are, particularly when they're going through puberty and they're, uh, you know, what ideas they get about sex in puberty are going to stay with them for the rest of their life. And if the vast majority of the images they are seeing are of women being violently abused, um, which I'm afraid is most of this pornography, there isn't even a separate category on Pornhub for strangulation now. It's so mainstream. So we are seeing girls, you know, being abused during sex, turning up in A&E with windpipe damage. You know, this is really extreme behaviour and yet it's being normalised. And we're now seeing about a third of child sexual abuse is actually child on child sexual abuse. So the idea that it's having no impact on society and that it's a private matter for adults is just completely untrue. And just as we protect children from drugs and alcohol, we have to protect them from, from pornography. So how does the online safety bill intend to do that? Um, well, several ways. I think it's it's really good news that it is coming back um, to the House. I understand that some of the difficult issues around legal but harmful that could have impacted on free speech have been sorted out. I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but that's my understanding. So I think that will mean it will pass through the House easier. Um, but so mainly, so for any pornography site that is a dedicated pornography site, they will have a duty to enforce proper age verification. I think there are some amendments that should be brought in the House of Lords to make that um, clearer and, and stronger, to make sure that it isn't a tick box, but there are genuine in, you know, foolproof technological ways of doing that. Um, but it also will put a duty on, on providers, on platforms to take down um, 
pornographic material on platforms that children use. I don't think it's strong enough yet. I think we need uh, it needs some work. Um, and we also need to equalise what's legal on and offline. So at the moment, apparently, porn DVDs do still exist. Um, but the rules for, for what's legal on that is very, very strict. There's lots and lots of activity that, that is illegal. Mm -hmm. But those, are, those activities are legal in online porn. So we need to, to equalise online and offline. There are concerns, of course, that if, if we go down this route of a digital identification system, that it does compromise everybody's civil liberties. Do you worry about that? I am concerned about civil liberties in a more general sense. And I think, you know, the way we saw in COVID how easy and quick it was for the government to regulate almost every way, every area of our lives in a way that wasn't evidence based um, or, uh, or didn't go through democratic scrutiny was very concerning. But I think we need to separate that from this issue because the online safety bill has been through an enormous amount of democratic scrutiny and has changed a lot as a result. And I think it's a bit like saying, you know, with the opiates trade, you know, a few hundred years ago, oh, we shouldn't we shouldn't regulate it because it's a matter of personal freedom. Everything has limits and that includes personal freedom. And when something is is harming children and harming society as much as pornography is, I mean, you know, not to mention the, the high profile rates and murders that have been committed just in recent years by men who are addicted to hardcore porn. We can't stand up and say this is just a freedom issue. It isn't. It's actually a public health issue. And I think alongside the online safety bill, we do need some proper research. And it'll be building legislation on proper research and democratic scrutiny that will make sure that civil liberties are appropriately respected whilst also protecting people that we desperately need to protect. I can't help feeling that we missed the boat here, Miriam, didn't we? At what stage do you think somebody the government or a regulator should have stepped in and said, this internet thing is gonna cause more harm than good. Well, the short answer is money. I mean, look how powerful uh, the tech companies are, mm. uh, how much money they have. It's not in their interests for this kind of regulation. They could stop children viewing pornography right now, today, if they wanted to, but they won't. And that's why, unfortunately, we've got to have go down the legislative route. Uh, you know, it's also true the government has missed a boat on this. In I think it was in our 2015 Conservative Manifesto that we promised to do something about this. Uh, and we started to bring some legislation forward. It didn't become enacted. The online safety bill has been going on a long time. Yeah. But I think fundamentally, we missed a boat on regulating the tech industry when we decided that they weren't publishers and therefore they weren't responsible for the content that's published on their platforms. But, you know, we can't go back and we've got to go forward. And, you know, as problematic as, as this bill has been, I do think it's a once in a generation opportunity to, put, to protect children when we've got to support it. You've been making a very good public case for the online safety bill, but do you feel supported by the government? Who else is getting behind it? Yes, very much. And I think... Uh, Michelle Donnellan, who's the new uh, DCMS secretary, so she's responsible for pushing this through. She's got to grips with this very quickly. She's understood the difficulties mm -hmm. around some of the free speech elements and worked on those. So I think it will have, you know, very, very strong conservative support, both in the Commons and the Lords, which is great. I'm pretty sure it's got cross-party support too. But I think the one further thing that the government needs to do is to do this proper piece of research into the, the society-wide harms of porn so that when we're writing the secondary legislation, the detail, we really know what we're dealing with and, and how to manage it. You've obviously been looking at these really sad stories, particularly of the um, sexual abuse, child-on-child -child, uh, crimes. Do the families of those children and the parents, do they know what's going on? Does it come as a terrible shock to them? Yes, I think it does, because I think anybody under kind of 35, under 30, didn't grow up. We didn't grow up with the internet, with all this information and these images and these videos at the touch of a button. So it's quite hard for people of our generation to appreciate um, the impact. And also, it's the privacy, isn't it? You know, when we were kids, our parents basically knew what we were doing. We might be able to sneak off and do something behind their back, or, you know, we might be able Write to read. Exactly. But, but if you rang your bed. friend, you're in the hallway. You yeah. know, they could understand, hear everything you say. And there's children now, you know, the influences on them are way beyond parental control. And so, yes, of course, parents just, just really don't understand what's going on. And I think it's just shocking. Do you think that the phone companies should actually sell the handsets with the security tech already on board? Absolutely. And the latest Apple devices, uh, the latest update, they do have this um, inbuilt 
uh, mechanism that can recognize, I think, nude images. And, you know, in typical Apple style, it then gives the choice to a child of whether they want to view it or not, which is a bit ridiculous. But it, it shows that the tech is possible. Yeah. So why can't all devices in the hardware have an ability to switch on a parental control which identifies potentially pornographic images and basically doesn't allow them to appear on the phone? Mm -hmm. And then you're not reliant on WhatsApp and other encrypted technologies from trying to find these images and remove them. They're just the child never sees them in the first place. So again, this is a solution that tech companies could implement now, but they won't. And so that's why we need to legislate. Is there any incentive for the phone companies to do this? Well, I, I just think it, uh, only legislation and the potential to be um, fined. I mean, I personally would go one step further and make directors individually criminally liable. So let's say there's an accident on the building site and it turns out that, you know, the manager, the site manager was negligent. They could be put in prison if it's criminal negligence. Why can't it be the case that if a child views a, you know, a, views a video of a rape, let's say, because a director has been negligent in allowing that on the platform, why shouldn't they be criminalised? Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're going to get that far at this iteration of the online safety bill, but I think it's something to look at for the future. So in your opinion, Miriam, does the online safety bill go far enough? I think it's a brilliant start. I think those amendments of firstly um, equalising online, offline, making sure that porn on on social media platforms is treated the same as porn on porn sites, making sure that it's the age verification is implemented quickly. So these are all amendments that could be brought in the Lord and I very much would hope have government support. So yes, if, if that's the case, yes, I think it's a really good start. But we also need this big piece of government led research into what are the wider harms, because it isn't just to children. You know, it is men who unfortunately are addicted and being drawn by the algorithms of the of the porn sites into more and more hardcore, extreme, shocking material and ending up looking at child sexual abuse material. You know, normal guys who think they're watching mainstream pornography ending up as criminals. And that's happening more and more. And yes, of course, people have to take responsibility for their action. But we also need to recognise the evil in these sites that is drawing them towards that. I don't know about you, Miriam, but I'm just wondering whether there are too many men making these decisions who don't actually know how hard it is as a parent to monitor what your children are seeing uh, online. Do you think that's fair? That might be true. true, although, you know, I do work with some excellent male colleagues who do understand, yeah. but I think it is just harder for men to talk about this. Mm. Um, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, you know, there's the obvious thing, which is far more men watch pornography than women. So, you know, you, you've got... Maybe they don't want you to take away Perhaps, their perhaps. But, but I think also it's, you know, as a woman, understanding the kind of deep misogyny of pretty much all pornography, you know, gives you a bit of fire in your belly that I don't want my daughters to be treated like this. I don't want my sons to think this is normal because this is just terrible for boys and girls. And I think it's probably at the moment easier for women to talk about it. But I think, you know, if we can get more public profile around this issue, I think we'll find more men mm. um, speaking up. So just help me understand it. With the age verification software, how many details would you have to give? Would you have to give your credit card, your name, your address? maybe that's where we have to balance uh, you know understandable um, you know preferences for privacy with the societal harms that are going on here and I think for too long we've seen porn as a private matter and perhaps it once was um, but if you look at the kinds of pornography that are now mainstream you know somebody might be sitting at home in their own private room viewing the, the, these images but it's having a, an impact on how they view women how they treat women what they think of is is normal during sex it is having an impact on the whole of culture and the whole of society that's very negative mm -hmm. so is it actually a private matter or should, yeah. should it be seen as a, as a society, as a public health issue, in which case we've got to balance these rights. But as I said, I think there are technological ways of age verification without um, revealing identity. And that, but the tech industry can do that already. Uh, it just needs to be enforced.